My friend, he was telling a, a group of people the other day, he sent me a video of it, that he was he was on a plane watching a video on the plane about some crash in the mountain and they ended up having to eat each other and then when they ran out of eating each other, then they had to go for the airline food, right? It was like, it was like last on the list. James Schramko here. Welcome back to my podcast. This is episode 985 and we're chatting with Sue Rice again. Welcome back, Sue. Thank you so much for having me again. It's a pleasure. Yeah, well, you know, like I, I love having guests back uh, when they did a good job the first time. And um, I'm always <laughs> gauging the response from my audience. I mean, I don't do things always just for my audience. I mean, you don't do this many podcasts without having a self-interest in it. I think one of the greatest assets for having a podcast is that I get this glorious education and opportunity uh, to be able to interact with people at a high level and and doing really cool stuff. And, you know, like six weeks ago, I was sitting there in emergency ward of my local hospital in a lot of pain. It turned out I'd broken some ribs. And it was from the day before. Uh, I was riding home from a surf. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw this little flash, this little this little blink. And I thought, oh, maybe that's a bush turkey because there's a lot of those around here and they're pretty small. But it was um, bigger than that and I felt this thud and next thing you know I was just on the ground uh, on the asphalt and momentarily I feel like I blacked out a little bit and then the next thing you know I was sitting beside the road and I was winded I couldn't breathe and then I just imagined a big eagle flapping its wings and then I finally was able to release my um, breath. And then I'd noticed the car behind me had stopped and uh, he was on the phone to the ambulance and the ambulance came and they they checked me out and I uh, did a pretty good job of convincing them I'm okay to, to ride home. And so I had someone pick up my motorbike. It was just a scooter and uh, the ambulance followed me home and as I got home I, I said bye and they said bye James. But the next morning I, was, I knew I'd broken my ribs. I was in so much pain. So I went and got it checked got some painkillers, took those for one week and uh, stopped taking them after a week because I didn't want to get hooked on oxys. And that whole week I did all my podcasts, I did all my coaching calls, I didn't mention anything to anybody and it was about three weeks in I was able to just start surfing but it was just too painful and then I skipped a few days and then by week four back again and then week five finally and now six weeks in I can sleep on my right hand side and I can surf and swim and I'm completely back to normal and and the the meaning of this whole story is to say that now that I'm back in full health and feeling vibrant and fantastic I have a lot of gratitude for just how lucky Mm -hmm. we are if we're still functioning and we're still breathing we're lucky and and beyond that as I pull up my microphone and my camera I'm just lucky to be able to speak to you Sue and to talk about your book Mm -hmm. Tiny Thunder. So I appreciate you sending this to me. And I get sent a lot of books. But I picked up this book and I thought, I have to speak with Sue about this. And I asked you if you'd do this podcast. And I could see it in my schedule coming up. So I started reading it. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't <laughs> stop reading it. And I'm like, hang on, I've got to go. I've got to go and pick up something. I'll, I'll come back. And then I uh, came back, I'm, I'm even in my infrared sauna reading it, trying to turn the pages without sweating on it too much. And it's such a good book. It's unusual that a book will be that good for me to read straight away. I read this book in like literally one you know, half a day today and last night. So it's a really good book. Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. I wasn't sure what to expect from the title, Tiny Thunder. It didn't mean much to me at the time. I read the subheadline, Irresistible Messaging for an Overwhelmed World. And I thought, okay, because I knew you're good at emails. We've spoken many times before. We did some coaching for a while. We did a podcast before about emails, not making boring emails. And then I read the back of the cover and it gave me the only persuasion tool you'll ever need. That's very seductive. And then it talks about overwhelm, et cetera. And it positions you well as having been the, the female David Ogilvy. But the book is great. I actually took notes, which is also a good sign of a book. I ended up with uh, about a handful of notes that were great. And here's the really interesting thing. This is what happens when I read a good book like that. 
in my coaching rounds, which I do, I start recommending it to people. I actually took a screenshot of one thing. It was circle thinking versus square thinking. And I sent that to a friend of mine who I think is very linear and very conversions focused. And I said, I, I read this and I thought of you. And he's like, oh, I'm really intrigued. Where did you get that from? That's fascinating. That's very deep. And so I sent that to him. And then another guy who's at the moment trying to come up with his amazing campaigns for his online marketing. And I said, please just get this book. It's going to tell you why if you're doing the hero's journey and you're so interested in making this brand story that you might be doing it all wrong. And he's like, wow, mm -hmm. I've got to get this because that's what everyone's been telling everyone to do, right? That's exactly right. I feel like, I mean, and I know as a copywriter that when people talk about storytelling vis-a-vis -vis marketing, everyone thinks they're talking about brand storytelling. And there's nothing wrong with brand storytelling, by the way. But as a copywriter, I realized early on that it has a really short runway, right? Because there's only so many times you can tell your brand story. You know, maybe Sarah Blake Lee is an exception to that rule, but most, most of us, our brand story is something that we can only repeat a number of times. What's great about uh, Tiny Thunder, which is essentially taking any story and using it as an illustration of a value or a benefit or a pain point or a challenge, the, the runway becomes infinite. There's just because there are infinite stories out there. So the other day, just a few days ago, I read this story about Steve Jobs and his wife took eight years to decide on which couch to buy. So well, he, instead he didn't of have saying, furniture for a long time, did he? I imagine that would have been a very confronting <laughs> thing. Yeah, I feel like that was like a real challenge for him. Yeah. And, and also because, you know, he was really into design and all that. But I could write an email and say, are you having trouble making a decision? Or I could just tell that story. Which one would you remember? Would you remember me saying, do you have a problem making decisions? Or would you remember the Steve Jobs story? It's a perfect illustration of it. And, you know, there are millions of different examples. Like I remember I was telling the story. I don't know if you read the story. There was this guy who was flying from the Bahamas to Miami. And he was the passenger and he was in his flip flops and his jeans. And he looked up, you know, like there were like six people on the plane. It was like a small little private plane. And he realized that the pilot was slumped over, right? And not driving the plane. So he like, he ran up, he pushed the pilot aside, got to the, you know, the, the, whatever, the navigation board. And he called the air traffic controller and said, well, the pilot's out, really sick, and I'm flying the plane, but I've never done that before. <laughs> and anyway, the, the whole story is about how they brought him in safely. And it's, it's actually a really funny story because, you know, he ended up landing safely. Oh, everyone was holding their breath at the air traffic controller because he went off the radar. And all of a sudden, after about a minute of everyone holding their breath, they heard, OK, I'm on the ground now. What do you want me to do now? <laughs> <laughs> and so so that would be a great story to illustrate what happens when you're trying to fly your business without navigation and how you need help and you know but it's a much more entertaining way of instead of saying i think you need a mentor you tell that story and that's the kind of thing that and it makes it much it's much fun more fun it's much more entertaining and the thing that's most important is it's much more memorable and you get people's all their radars down. It doesn't feel like a cell. It feels like we're talking like people. You're joining the conversation. You're not interrupting it. It's crazy. I don't know if you can hear this on the podcast either, but there is literally thunder outside right now. There was a massive thunder <laughs> clap. I don't know if that's a sign, but that I haven't. we haven't experienced that for a while. It's been very, very hot. <laughs> And then, and there's that's a my guardian storm. angel saying that, hi to you. That's the saying, you're right, Sue, you're right. What I noticed about the book, that the reason I kept reading it is it was story after story after story, all yeah. the way through using stories and illustrating what point you're making with a story. But then you also had a technical yeah. breakdown. I really like the part where you talk about how you can tap into your own library, like where you can get the stories from, because that's where people run aground and you've got this very technical stuff about what the story can be about like choosing your story i like that value 
an obstacle, a pain point, a benefit, a dream. And then you talk about the treasure troves of different places you can get stories. I won't spoil it all. Of course, you have to get the book to understand where you get those from. But here are some of the sound bites that I love the most. Th- these are the things that I was nodding to. And I'm speaking to the, the person listening to this podcast. We need to eradicate these canned communications. Often as a coach, people are saying, oh, I've, I'm doing my funnel, I've got my webinar and I've pre-written my first 50 emails and I say, can you put them in a document and share it with me? And I read them and it's just rubbish, just schlocky stuff that's basically oh, three emails in and asleep. It's like, come on, we've got to it's do copy better. copy and paste. We've got to it's stop doing this. We've got to eradicate these canned communications. What you're yeah. teaching with the tiny thunder is metaphoric storytelling. The big things that really hit hard for me are that it does not have to be the full hero's journey. That might have a place. You said there might have a place for that. But what you talk about is these little tiny sound bites. I think you call them vignettes as well. But just we might be able to use micro content in a far more engaging way, whether it's an email, whether it's a video, and it's almost certainly going to be video for, for me and a lot of my audience. These stories are very, very powerful, but they can be quick. It's more of a scene. You don't like if you think about when you go like this weekend I had a bunch of friends over and when you talk it's like stream of consciousness it's little story snacks. Did you see that meme? Wasn't that funny? And no one sits down at the dinner table and says, "Okay, here's my hero journey." This is what happens, and this is the victim, and this is the no, it doesn't work. There's well, a villain and I no feel one like sometimes if someone does that, I get the feeling that this is basically a, a premeditated can spiel. Yeah. Like you can, Whereas it's, there's it's, a, when yes, that little bit of vomit accent. starts forming in your mouth. Oh, here we go. Here's that park bench story. <laughs> yeah, I know where this is going, right? You, could, you can tell this is completely contrived and we switch off. That's exactly right. I think people underestimate what has happened to our communication ecosystem in the last 20, 30 years and the amount of data and input that is flooding our way on an hourly, daily basis. And that if you are doing those 15 cut and paste emails that you're just talking about, you're not going to cut through it. The irony about Tiny Thunder, because it's using stories that aren't actually about your product, (laughs) <laughs> to illustrate your product, you're actually going to be get much farther with your product if you do that versus talking about it in a linear, this is the features I do, which is what all those copy and paste templates, that's how they're organized. It's very left brain. And whereas these little story snippets get people really fast. It's such a big idea. And they you know? open your, they open your email uh, to me. Email is a really great delivery system for this, but you can deliver it on social media. You can do it through videos. You can you do it in, in, your, in coaching or or um, in any kind of sales Presentations. Platform. Like, for example, I had a conversation today. I've got a client. He's a partner of mine. He's got an agency. But every time I talk to him, he's got this dream of a membership. He just wants a membership. And he's like, so I want to do a membership. What kind of deliveries will I need to do? Like how many calls will I need to offer? How many? I said, stop, please stop. Like you're approaching this the whole wrong way. Like your whole thing is I want a recurring subscription business. It'll be a membership. What do I have to give people to make that? Like st- no, find out what are the goals and aspirations of the people you want to serve. Like let's say they're software companies and you said this in the book, right? So I just – literally took the idea from the book that you said and I said this to him. So I just read it and then I'm just having this call. I said they're obsessed with growth. That's what they want, right? They want growth and they want a big payout. That's what they want. So you say if you'd like growth and if you'd like a big payout, then I have created the system that will get you there, right? We'll go on this mission together. If that's the goal, I've got the whole spaceship, we can do this. We can get you in there. We can take you through the program. We can get you certified. We'll look after all your nutrition and everything else and we'll get you to that destination. 
rather than saying, oh, we're going to serve meals with this content of protein and this content of carbohydrates or that we will be doing structured lessons of no longer than 17 minutes, seven times a day. Like yeah, but- don't, don't bore people with all this nitty-gritty stuff. Get them involved in that big emotional idea and – you know what I loved? And the destination, right? Yeah. Like when you fly, I mean, of course, you know, I'm in France, so this is a little biased, but when you fly to Paris, you don't care what you're eating on the plane. You care about the scene at the cafe when you get there and wandering through the street, the destination. People are way too much involved in, you know, what seat they're going to be sitting in on the way to the destination. That's not what's important. It's getting to the destination that's important. And the hope and the dreams that that embodies, right? Yeah, I don't think anyone's thinking about airline food. <laughs> like the, no, um, yeah, exactly. No one cares what they eat on the plane. My friend, he was telling a, a group of people the other day, he sent me a video of it, that he was he was on a plane watching a video on the plane about some crash in the mountain and they ended up having to eat each other. And then when they ran out of eating each other, then they had to go for the airline food, right? It was like, it was like <laughs> last on the list. So That was really funny. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very funny. So what, what I loved is you've put all the science in there and explained why we are so biased towards that emotion. One of the things in there was fascinating was where students placed a meaning on things that we as humans want we want to put that story in there even even if it's not there we're going to create a story around it and it sort of made me think about imagine the stories we tell about ourselves and if we can tap into those stories that people are independently having about themselves and collectively move them along in in a way that's good for them that could be a very powerful tool and think about it too because that sort of elevates marketing to a whole other plane, right? Because if you're telling stories about that are important to you, like what you told at the beginning of this podcast, right? And then someone else independently can really relate to that story. You're not relating on, you know, James products, you're relating at a much higher level. And that's a much stronger bond. And, you know, it's much more profitable at the end because it's you're hooked up here versus at this sort of lower level, which is where most people are playing. Most that's the playground that most people are playing in. And it's a pity because there's this whole area up here where there's a lot of room to play and no one's not a whole lot of people are taking advantage. Well, it's it's a tremendous opportunity, isn't it? There were three reasons I told that story at the top of this episode. One is I wanted to use an example of the framework that you talk about, which is to tell a story, then explain the meaning and then provide a call to action. Two is in one of my previous episodes, I mentioned that I had some broken bones to one of my guests and I've been inundated by email. Like what happened? (laughs) Tell me what happened. You wanted to explain. Because I didn't didn't (laughs) go to socials about it. I didn't post the pictures of the destroyed surfboard uh, you know to my business community or whatever or the helmet and all the rest of it I just kept it to myself because I know a lot of people love the drama right they want the drama they want all the attention and that now that I've recovered I don't feel like I'll be doing it to attract attention I'm already fine right (laughs) but the third reason and this is probably critical and and it speaks to the the library behind me when I learn something new I want to implement it straight away I want to get it into my repertoire I've read your book today and last night and I've already been using it on several calls, using the examples and getting these ideas across. So it's a very usable text which I think is terrific and it's not too big and it's not too short. It's just right. So absolutely delightful. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, I, I I feel like the other thing about it is, you know, you go back to the example of people sending you these big tomes of sort of template type messages. That's not that's sludge. It's, it's sludge for the sludge. person reading it. And it, but it's sludge for the person creating it, too, James. So what's great about Tiny Thunder is it's actually fun. It's fun because you can start using all kinds of stories, private stories, things you read on social media, things you read in the news, it's just everywhere. And then all of a sudden, trying to share what you're doing becomes much more fun. I, Not to mention 
more persuasive. <laughs> well, actually, um, now I've reached a level of sort of awareness with the podcast that we get the exact same cut and paste template every single day, like dozens of them every day. It's the exact same template. So someone out there teaches <laughs> this. This is one of yeah. my cautions. If you're buying a course or you're getting trained on how to do these things, if someone gives you a framework or template, it's critical to step beyond that and to understand what caused this template to work when it did work. Has it been commoditized? And don't just turn your brain off and cut and paste because you're going to get into trouble. I got one classic the other day. There was a guy sending me a message. It's like, it's like hey, Lincoln, we're going to be able to do your videos completely differently to all the other companies who are saying that they can do it. We customize and individualize absolutely every element of our... I'm like, dude, you didn't even put my correct name. Right <laughs> I name. screenshot it because <laughs> I'm terribly embarrassed. And like, so that's it. That's like he shot himself in the foot so badly. That's, that's irrecoverable from that point. And just by, as an aside, we're not looking for Hermosi style videos to be done by a contractor. We should get that one every single day. So I feel like some stories could be overused. What I like about the way you've approached this, Sue, is you've told us how this works and why this works and what it is, but you've you've basically given us a toolkit and we get to build it now right. rather than you just giving us a finished product saying just send this, it'll work. Right. That's exactly right. Which for some people, there's a level of discomfort to be honest with you because they want to be able to just sort of copy and paste. But I feel like it's like an exercise, right? Like if you try Tiny Thunder a couple times, you realize how much it's not hard that it is a kind of a really simple formula, right? Mm. Story, the yeah. lesson of the story, and then a call to action. And you'll, you can sound individual and it can be fun for you. And it will certainly be fun for your readers. It's only, um, they it's will, one step uh, the shorter readers than, or viewers. One step shorter than the framework I've used for, you know, since 1991 when I discovered it, the spin selling formula. Uh, has right. pretty much carried me for 30 years as a very good framework for just selling or teaching and yours is only three parts, you know. <laughs> so I, yeah. I love how simple it is and I, I feel like it's very easy to use. I like how you address the fact that people are going to be challenged to f- think of stories. There are a couple of stories in the book that I'd already heard before and there were plenty of stories that I hadn't heard before. So I thought that that would be the risk if you lean too heavily on the most famous people's stories, they're more likely to be commoditized. The more you lean into your personal stories, the the less likely is that anyone's actually ever heard of them before. So I think if you could tap that well, that would be endless, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, th- I think the personal, I do make that point in the book. You do. That's the richest, that's the richest place to start. But it's always good also to kind of bring in things that people are already talking about. I mean, exactly, depending like on news jacking. your comfort level. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of news jacking, but it's a twist on news jacking, if you will. And it's kind of talking about what is top of mind to people. It's, I, I keep coming back to this idea of most marketing and most communications interrupts. And what's nice about this method is it joins the conversation, just like the story you told at the beginning of the podcast joins the conversation. It's not. And I feel like a lot of people feel like they have to yell louder when actually that you don't need to do that to be more persuasive. It's not about volume. <laughs> it's not. No, it's too much right? noise. Like these cut and pasters, they're just contributing to the noise, the meaningless, endless noise. It's like these scraper sites that just publish rubbish, you know, trying to sell their ads. If you That's can, right. can cut a unique path, then you'll get the results. It's actually one reason why I watch Netflix shows and Amazon shows, et cetera. I want to see what normal people are watching and Me being, too. basically how they're being taught to think and feel about things like the the training that goes on you made a point in your book uh that someone else made a point i think steve jobs made the point that at the time when at certain time disney was basically in control of the whole entertainment thing you know for a long time he said well that you know they get to dictate how people think and react it's 
true some of the the big content creators are teaching people what to want and what their goals should be i've broken this down in previous episodes like a lot of people in my industry they really want their magical 10 million dollars revenue that's the number i think there's been inflation just quietly i think but probably because of alex hormosi 100 million dollars seems to be the more popular number these days it, basically unless you're making 100 million dollars you're pretty much a nothing is part of the narrative that starts to permeate through the the fabric of it all. And then we get other advocates like your Gary V's who over time is sort of moved from hustle and grind more to love and uh, acceptance and, and just being genuine and stuff. So I've seen people shift the narrative, but these power players, uh, it's really good to understand that, you know, when you see them post content and you get all the people's reactions to them, they are driving a strong force. So I guess at the moment of recording this, I've been seeing Elon Musk doing this on Twitter because he recently bought it and he has been running polls and engaging an awful lot of people. So, you know, he's got the eyeballs, he's got the attention and he can tell the stories. And he's he's certainly got a, a unique story. The, the stuff that he comes up with, he's highly imaginative and, and he does evoke a, a strong emotional reaction. That's absolutely right. You look at sort of big players that have really made a mark in the tech industry and beyond. They actually all use these kinds of methods. I mean, Steve Jobs was a tiny thunderite, right? It, it was he was nothing but metaphoric storytelling, and it's why. I mean, a lot of people probably don't remember this, but at the beginning, Apple was the only company that had a personality. Yeah, it was the. The only it was just one big gray mass of brands and Apple, and, and that's, that's because of the way much he cornered the creative market in the beginning, didn't it? That's right, and so people that were making films or videos, that whole creative crowd, you would never not use Apple, right? I mean, it's mm. changed a lot since the beginning, but but you know, I mean, I was in the ad industry at that you know in the traditional ad industry at that time, and no one would have ever gotten. An uh, IBM, that would have been impossible. You have everyone had apples, even if they didn't know how to use them, they would tuck them under their arms. <laughs> I'm dealing. It was with a badge the, of. <laughs> I know someone who's dealing with a government website in in another country at the moment, and they're trying to get access to a Windows computer because you have to have a Windows computer to use the government yeah. website. I was like, it still blows my mind that this is possible in uh you know at this time that is crazy that is crazy that's very very um entrenched i'm sure there'd be a story around that someone in the government department (laughs) needs needs to hear a story (laughs) yeah no i think that it's um a friend of mine actually from ogilvy read the book and he said this is a narrative that will probably buyers will love and sellers will feel less comfortable with i thought that was an interesting point because I think people feel like if they're not talking about their product in a really literal and linear way, they're not going to get the sales. Whereas if you wrap it up in a metaphoric story, um, you actually, I mean, I've seen it with lots of my clients, you get a lot more sales. I do too, actually. I remember remember hearing some sales cassettes and it would have been in probably around 20 years ago where they were warning against product dumping the typical bad salesperson just focuses on specs and and dumps all the product features and they're not concerned at all about the customer. The interesting thing that I found in my sales journey was by focusing on the customer and solving their problems, which I would understand better, I could relate to them and tell stories that made them much more aware of how their problem was going to be solved and they'd feel good about it. So I found because I was married and had a kid or I had a kid coming when I first got a sales job and then and then not that long, six months later, I did have a kid. From that point on, I was able to relate to just about anyone who walked in the door on something, whether it was school, sport, marriage, having kids or whatever. And there's a lot of stories. Have you noticed how a mother's groups or parents' groups, I think they call them now, uh, there's a lot of storytelling going on in those sort of groups. Of, or when you go to a, a barbecue or a, a dinner, you hear story after story after story all night long. I mean, it's interesting what you say because in the end, 
at one point in the book, I talk about this, but it's about finding the intersection. So when you were selling cars, for example, you were trying to find the intersection between you and the buyer, right? And that's what these metaphoric stories do. It's like a bridge between you and your consumer so that you're all nodding yes. And then guess what? It's not that hard for them to nod yes to what I call the invitation, which is ever the, whatever the next step is, watching a video, buying something, whatever. And But it's finding the intersections versus finding the best hammer to put the nail in, right? And I think there's a... As Seth Godin talks about, which I actually really agree with him, there's a generosity to that. And I feel like it really, people underestimate the power of that. Gosh, when you say that, it really brings back memories. I remember sitting there listening to people on the other side of the desk and just listening and opening my eyes and and looking straight into their eyes and listening. I was absolutely (laughs) being generous in hearing them out because I realized that my opinion didn't matter. It was only really down to the customer's opinion and I had to be responsible to help them form a good opinion that would serve them well and also meet the needs of, That's right. uh, of me. You're right. A good bridge building. That's right. But yeah, yeah I think it's like- definitely endured some nutcases, I can tell you. <laughs> I think we all have. <laughs> <laughs> there was one guy, there was this guy who was famous for, and I didn't know it at the time, the first time I met him I didn't know this, but he used to dress up in a pretty fancy suit, like a full pinstripe suit and he spoke uh, kind of like a judge would, very formal and he had a little handkerchief out of his top pocket and he would come and he would order like one of the most expensive cars and he'd sign the contract and when it came to the deposit, he, he'd say, I'll send you in a check this afternoon and then he'd disappear. Like he just, he would never be able to be followed up. He would ghost you. And I found out that uh, he'd done this to all the dealerships. This was pretty much uh, someone who was probably not quite right in the head. And this was just his thing and he did it a lot. So it was like, I remember I'd, I'd listen to the whole thing. I'd go <laughs> go along with the whole bit, but sometimes it didn't pan out. That's crazy, that story. Yeah, I, I still remember his name. I'm not saying his name out of respect for uh, the, the fact that I've <laughs> d- declared that he might be not mentally fit. And I'm almost certain he probably isn't alive anymore because this was 20 years or so and he was fairly senior then. But his first name was Terry. I'll leave it at that. But but Terry was pretty famous for getting around the car yards and, and buying cars, just repeatedly buying cars, like going through the whole motions as if it's going to happen. Wow, that's a crazy story. You know, the be- the best stories I have, and I wheel them out on occasion, uh, my debt collection stories. <laughs> that's some fascinating things. Oh, but I bet. The, the thing that I really, the thing I resonated about this whole sort of you identifying some of the, the frameworks for it and, and telling us what's actually going on is I realized I've always used stories to sell and I've always used stories to teach. And I love how you broke down metaphors you broke them down into different subcategories and I was always confused until I read your book about the difference between a metaphor or an analogy. But I wonder if you could just sort of cover that for a second. Well, a metaphor, strictly speaking from a literary standpoint, is like a sentence, right? But an analogy, I mean, really analogy is a little bit more bigger metaphor, if you will. It goes a little bit deeper. And what I do, instead of like kind of splitting hairs on those definitions, to me, anything that compare, basically the idea of a metaphoric thinking is that you take an idea from one one concept and you borrow it and apply it to another one. So for example, my dog is fat. <laughs> I have a really fat St. Bernard. I call her a whale. That's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I call in French, we call it a baleine. I say she's my baleine and everyone will know she's lovely and nice and fat. (laughs) Right. That's a kind of a very small metaphor. And then, but then an analogy is, it goes a little bit deeper than that. But there are all the things like similes, which are like when you say, you know, She's sweet as honey. She just, she's like honey. She that's that's a simile because you use the word like. But they're all the same. They come from the same family. And the whole key of a metaphoric thinking is comparing 
one unlike thing to another, but they both share an essence, if you will, right? So, so obviously, my St. Bernard is not a whale, no. but she shares the essence of a whale, right? Yeah, so things that would, would apply to a whale could possibly apply to this dog. So a friend of mine, Trevor. Right, so Trevor like, let's talk about whales and crypto. Oh, yeah, oh, we sorry, do. Go we ahead. do whale. Well, you made a great point. We talk about, about whales and they're like big – uh, sorry, I'm not a crypto crypto expert, but well, nobody um, is anymore. My All my will... Facebook crypto experts have disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> Funny how that happened. Um, <laughs> but the whale is someone who has is like big investor, right? Like is it, you know, and but that's a great that's a great metaphor. It's a great metaphor that you can use. That's the other thing that well, you, people you mentioned. All the finance like, ones. Example, there, there's, there's so many ones for finance. It's, it's crazy. There's so many for finance, but there's also like, so one of the, the examples I put in the book that I love, it's one of my favorites, is the, that scene in Annie Hall where Diane Keaton and Woody Allen are sitting in the plane and they look at each other and they're like, this relationship just isn't working. And Woody Allen says, yeah, you know, a relationship is like a, a shark and it needs to keep moving. And if it doesn't keep moving forward, it dies. And I think what we have on our hands is a dead shark. And, but I love that analogy because you don't, it's not just about relationships. There are a lot of dead sharks out there in terms of businesses and in terms of, you know, how we look after ourselves. And you could apply that dead shark analogy to a million different concepts and it's fun and people will remember it, even if they never even saw any hall. Except uh, for marine biologists who know that some sharks sleep. <laughs> Let, let's not let's not be too literal <laughs> yeah so so um a friend of mine trevor he's often on this podcast toe cracker you probably know him he's in copyright yeah. circles but yeah uses, we're i mean he's we've never cliches. spoken but we're friends on facebook all the time yeah? he uses cliches i love his material and i've i've used his headlines i've published some of them with his permission in my own community because i use a lot of them for the podcast episodes but the cliches, I still remember when I was at school, I used a cliche, I think it was um, this This put a spanner in the works and my teacher shredded me for it. He said, don't use cliches, they're lazy and they're, they're trite or over, overdone. A cliche sounds a lot like it, it could be a metaphor. Oh, yeah. I think the thing that I try to avoid, because the whole point of what I'm trying to do with Tiny Thunder is surprise, right? There are a lot of metaphors out there that have been used five million times too, right? Yeah. But if you've heard it over and over again, and it's almost like a then natural part of anymore. your language, then so the comparison has dulled, right? That's the problem with it. So that's why I would avoid that. I mean, yesterday something happened to me and I thought I thought of it as a great metaphoric story. So there was a person that I was with years and years ago who just passed, right? And he, when I was with him, he had this really young son. And I remember this young son swimming in a pool in Hawaii. He was like two. And I was looking at the video. There was a video of the, the funeral and I'm like, this, it was a 32 year old man. And I'm like, oh my God. And I thought, what a perfect story. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where like, how could that possibly be the same person that I knew then? So I could talk about, wow, change is bewildering, but telling a story like that and maybe showing two pictures of the little boy I knew and this man that's speaking at this, it's like, how it could it be the same person? That's a much more, powerful way to talk about change too many people rely i mean i'm a word i'm a holic but sometimes you shouldn't be relying only on words you should can also be work using metaphoric visuals as well is what i'm trying to say right oh, okay. I think and you can it. if you you can use personal stories that that actually personal stories true yeah. stories that that are much less likely to have been heard by the reader. Like I notice, any time I start reading a story and I already have heard the story before, it does shut down some brain cells. It's like, yeah, okay, I've heard this before and it becomes predictable and it takes one step backwards in my mind. 
or but the, sometimes there are stories that are sort of what I would call third party stories that you might not have heard the twist on them, right? So yeah, but you it needs to be fresh. I guess that's one, you know, it needs to compare and it needs to feel fresh. There's nothing wrong with cliches, by the way, but you can also, even over the cliche, you can give it a little fresh twist, right? Well, I think that's probably why things like Game of Thrones were pretty popular because he would go against the traditional way of storytelling and like kill off a main character or do do um, <laughs> something you would never expect that, that that's so shocking. And it's unusual to get something that fresh from such a generic industry. But I think we all feel that way. I mean, even when you go to a Netflix or a, wherever you're watching your movies, I sometimes watch from Hulu. I don't know. I just feel like a lot of the stuff is just same old, same old. Oh, you do. It's just the same so, old it's stuff, and it's so you... exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I, and so Everyone, I won't, it, yeah. it won't survive. I'll have to kill yeah. it. You know, I'll kill it off. But you wonder how far that formula can go. But then some people don't have any formula. That's really where, where I think we can make the biggest impact, particularly with this episode. If you're not currently putting metaphors or stories into your marketing, if you're just product dumping or doing the logic thing, you're missing out on the whole opportunity. Yeah. I mean, not to get into the, all the neuroscience and everything, but you're literally not talking to someone's whole brain yeah. because our brain needs both the right and the left to be, you can't ignore the logical stuff in the future. I don't have a problem with that, but it needs to be dressed up in a, a bigger way and with with stories that go beyond brand storytelling because everyone knows that formula now. Well, I love the guy the who, who discovered that. He was sharing that story about how he lost part of his brain and was had no emotion for when he was shown, you know, disturbing pictures, but he could still make other, you know, normal, logical decisions. But he couldn't make decisions. Yeah, yeah, but so he, he could, couldn't make he decisions. Couldn't, he couldn't make decisions because he could feel emotions. That's it. So if you think emotions, a lot of people think emotions or even storytelling is a bit sort of, you know, it's sort of like marketing light. <laughs> and it isn't marketing light because you really need need them I think it's in order to get rich. people. It's marketing rich. Yes. Yeah, but a lot of people worry that if they're not feature enough and they're, I mean, I had a client, very, very famous client at the very beginning when I first started my own agency and they sold skis. Right. And I came in and we were talking about fiberglass and centimeters and this and that. And I said, listen, we need to get, you know, there's nothing more emotional than being on a mountain. There just isn't. So we went, we did this huge research and went to, we went all over from Japan to the Alps, to Vail. We were everywhere talking to people about the experience of the mountain. Sounds did like this a terrible amazing, assignment. You get some tough it was, gigs. It was fantastic. Yeah, I have, like, I have some really tough gigs. But someone has to do it, James. I was reading about but, your um, holiday in the Maldives and everything. I'm like, seriously, Sue, what's yeah, going on? Just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, it was fantastic. I did, and I ta- and then in the end, I talked about you know this whole theme of. There's this idea of fusion. I mean, you know this from surfing. It's the same thing. You know, it's like this ultimate concentration that gives you freedom. And it was just a really beautiful standing ovation for the presentation. I came back three weeks later. Guess what? They were still talking about centimeters of fiberglass. <laughs> but the, but that, that's what I was trying to say earlier. I think there's a level of discomfort I'm not talking about that, but all I'm saying is you can still talk about it, but just dress it up in a metaphor story that gives people, you don't have to choose. It's not black or white. You don't have to choose one or another, but, but when you don't use the power of stories, you're really uh, missing out. I mean, look what it's done for Christmas or Easter or whatever. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, like our thing, you know, we the Americans just celebrated Thanksgiving. That's a story. Yeah. It's and it's strong. These big story events, are, you know, I think, I can't recall, but someone, I think there was a story about some retailer sort of pushing Christmas a little bit harder back in the day to make sales more of a feature. But there's a, there's a lot of story wrapped around that commercial event or, you know, you could say the commercial events wrapped around the story either way. 
they do go hand in hand. I think they they seem to amp each other up a bit. It consumes you know, people see, for yeah. you know for a whole. Well, in Western society, a month. In in uh, the Philippines, it consumes them from the Burr months. So from September <laughs> onwards is Christmas. Really? Yep. You go. You go to a shopping center in September in the Philippines. You're going to hear Christmas carols and see Christmas trees. You know. What's interesting about it, going back to this concept of intersection, because we're like <clears throat> doing some, we're we're cleaning out some shelves in our house, and there's a lot of Christmas decorations. But there's an intersection between the those big shopping experiences outside the home and what's happening inside the home. Those little decorations that you have had for 15 years, those little, you know, all the little memories. And that's what makes the story so strong. It's not just that it's the brouhaha outside the home, but it's all the memories and storytelling that's happened inside. And it's the intersection that makes it so powerful. Uh, These, whether it's Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. It's also kind of like a photo album, isn't it? You know, old school photo. Yeah, that's it's really exactly just, what it is. It's just paper, paper and some coloured ink. But the way that they're formulated to make those highly visual things, it just unlocks memories and, and experiences and, and so forth. Or, but or that's what metaphors that, do. But that's what yeah, metaphors do. Exactly. They Same unlock the, lo- a song on the they radio. They unlock it's photo albums. Radio frequencies, but structured in a certain way to evoke a very strong reaction. Yeah, but that I but that's like I mean lyrics in a song. There's nothing stronger than that. I mean, we all have a song where we we're taken back to an old love or something horrible that happened to us or something amazing that happened to us. And you know, why not bring all that in because that's powerful. Bring it in. And there are a lot of songs that a lot of people feel the same way about too. Again, creating the intersection that you can put in your marketing. Why not? Love it. So in summary, you can use this technique across all mediums, even though the message is the message, right? Putting that message in whatever (laughs) medium that you happen to be playing with, uh, whether it's speaking from stage, running radio ads, sending emails, use your stories, put meaning to it, and then have a call to action. That's pretty much the formula, right. right? That's pretty much it's telling a story that illustrates a value that your you or your product embodies. It's telling a story that describes a challenge or a pain point, uh, one that maybe captures a dream that people have that they can't get. Um, So there's an infinite way that you can choose your story. Then you just tell the lesson. You say, you know, this is we can help you get to that dream or we can help you overcome that challenge. And then you invite them into whatever the next step is. It might be a purchase, but it might not be. It might be going and watching a video or reading an article or getting on the phone with you. Well, right? I love how you so do that. Very, you, you actually shared story, meaning, call to action, like over and over again, lots of and lots of examples. Yeah. So that's what made the book strong for me. It it covered off the concept. Yeah. It gave specific, clear examples. Breaks it all down. Uh, that's the book there, Tiny Thunder by Sue Rice. And uh, Sue, I don't know where the best place to get it is. Uh, the best place I got it was from you, <laughs> which is all that came from Amazon. <laughs> well, I mean, the people have two choices. They can go to Amazon. It's on Amazon everywhere. But I also, if they if you go to suerice dot com forward slash Tiny Thunder. You can also get, for a much less cost, a digital download and the audio as well. So that would be great too. And, you know, if you want to reach out and talk to me, I have people, it's it's touched a lot of people and I would love to talk to people. And I'd love to hear how people use it. I have someone who helps people get out the vote who's been using it on their Twitter so people are using it, you know, nonprofit organizations, consultants, everyone, lots of different people from lots of different walks of life, a lot of software companies. Love it. We'll put the links up there on episode 985 at jamesramco.com. Been chatting with Sue Rice, long-time friend Thanks. now. Thanks. I think originally yeah. I found you through Andre Chaperon, you know, like. It was either Andre, I think we were in. I can't remember, but it, I think it was Andre, actually. I'd have to listen back to Who my I'm still good episode. friends with. 
Yeah, what a, you know, obviously <laughs> legendary storytelling email copywriter. He said, Sue writes good emails. I think at the time he said you were one of the only few people on the planet that he would be comfortable recommending because I don't think he was providing a service. You've been providing a service no. for people, which is terrific. Well, thank you so much, Sue. Thanks for writing the thank book. Thank you. Thanks for thank um, you. coming along to the show. And uh, I hope, hope you um, get some people letting you know how they – that they'll probably tell you they heard about you on Tramco's podcast. That's what it was. That was the feedback we got so much. I changed the name of the podcast back to my personal name. So, so uh, there you go. There's the story behind that. It's great, and thank you very much, James, for having me. I really appreciate it. It was fun talking. Yeah, let's chat again soon, Sue. Yeah, take care. This is James Tramco. 